So, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Exploration Tour in Dallas. Um, thank you for that introduction, Skip, and thank you to Compar and for Broadway yeah, for hosting today. Um, so, um, I'm here to talk about CCM. Is it time to rethink and refresh? But before I get started, I know that there's a lot of technology folks in the room, but who here is actually from an enterprise? I'm just wondering. There we go. So, I understand this event is a little informal, so I thought I would start out with a little bit of humor um, and present this org chart. Um, how many people have reported to a vice president of the status quo or a vice president of no, right? Um, so this is really the whole idea behind, you know, do, is it time to rethink our CCM strategy? And one of the challenges is really convincing the executive team that, yes, CCM is important, especially if you're focusing on customer experience, right? CCM is a critical part of your customer experience strategy because it's your customer-facing piece for your company um, to your consumer. How many of you have heard this phrase? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? Now I'm in Texas, so I can use the word thing. <laughs> And while that's true for many, many aspects of life, it's not true for your customer communications, right? And I'm not talking about broke, meaning that it's not functioning properly. By the word broke, I mean that you're not meeting or exceeding your customer's expectations, okay? And for those senior executives that are vice president of no and vice president of status quo, they have to be convinced that yes, it is broken, right? And it does need some attention. So we hear about this convergence of CCM, customer experience, and digital transformation, right? And years ago, customer communications were, were maybe they were simple, right? Um, you, you created your documents, you printed them internally, you sent them out to a print service provider, and then you were done, right? And now the introduction of technology brings in new channels, right? First it was email. Um, and then there was a lot of focus on trying to uh, get customers to adopt email as a channel for delivery, especially because of a cost savings, right? Because print, the postage was really the biggest component of print and mail. Um, now you add in SMS and social media and web and mobile and, and all of these new channels. And then there's a lot of focus on customer experience and digital transformation. And if you haven't been able to catch up when you were here, that's where you end up, right? And so now you're behind the eight ball. Um, one of my clients, the CTO of the company said, keeping up with technology is like running up the down escalator. I thought that was kind of a funny analogy. <clears throat> when we talk about trends in CCM, right, um, there's a lot of focus on moving things to, to the cloud, cloud enablement or moving certain components to the cloud. John later on after me is gonna talk about API integration, right? Being able to um, connect to other types of solutions either to fill a gap in functionality so you don't have to develop it yourself or just, you know, and, and make that connection. Um, empowering knowledge workers and business users to be able to make changes to documents um, so that they can manage templates, maybe even create business rules, manage content, um, and lift that burden off of the IT group and, and put it where it belongs with the subject matter experts. And then something that we're seeing more and more of now is artificial intelligence and machine learning within CCM solutions so that they can rationalize content and, and train the uh, machine, if you will, to learn, learn how to recognize things and then continue processing um, from there. Customer experience, we all hear, we hear it every day, right? It's a strategic priority. It's, it's a competitive, it's working to get that competitive, competitive edge. Um, technology is driving those expectations. How many people in the room have a voice assistant? Alexa, right? And so that technology is, is getting more and more widely adopted. I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone and she was in the middle of a conversation. She said, hold on, Alexa, set the timer for 20 minutes. <laughs> so she was cooking and she needed to set the timer of the oven and then Alexa didn't do what she wanted to do and her voice got louder and then she had an expletive at the end and called Alexa a bad name. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I said, ooh, <laughs> I wonder how many times she gets called that. Um, so, but technology is driving those expectations and um, in uh, consume, customer experience is channel agnostic. I don't care if I go to your website, if I go to your mobile app, if I call you on the phone, walk into a branch, get a printed dot. I want the same experience. I want it to be seamless, I want it to be easy, um, and I want it to be a positive experience. Um, and what's also setting that expectation, it's, it's not by industry, right? You have the Amazons of the world and the Apples of the world that are creating these awesome experiences and now I go to my insurance company and I'm not trying to beat the insurance company up, but um, you know, they're a little bit behind, health insurance, regular insurance, and that expectation that 
folks are getting from companies like Amazon and Apple and Google and whatever, they're looking for that expectation or that same experience from other brands. Um, and in order to do that, you really need to understand the customer journey. What happens um, when, you know, from the point the customer becomes, um, you know, from the acquisition point and then further on through customer maintenance. A lot of times what happens is there's this great whiz-bang front end, right, to get the customer to sign on, and then there's the maintenance piece, and then you get ugly looking documents or the experience is really disjointed um, because of a lot of focus that was paid to the front end and not necessarily what happens along the journey. <clears throat> so there's definitions out there of customer experience and customer experience management. This is sort of my definition and it's basically just you know a process of creating positive, easy and seamless business interactions with your organizations so that customers are enticed to engage and to continue to do business with you. That's my definition. Some interesting statistics, there's a lot of analysts and research firms out there that are really focusing on customer experience and the benefit of providing a positive customer experience. Um, everything from customer churn to revenue growth. Um, so McKinsey said that 70% of buying experiences are based on how the customer feels. Um, Bain and company, you know, companies that excel can grow their revenue four to 8% above the market. But this one from New Voice Media, which is, I'm sorry if I'm standing in your way. Um, was interesting to me. Anybody consider themselves a serial switcher? If you have a bad customer experience and you change to another brand or another company, anybody here? Yeah, you're a serial switcher. <laughs> no, <laughs> skip behind you, raise your hand. <laughs> um, but so that was interesting. Uh, based on their uh, a, a report that came out in 2018, they said 67% of customers become serial switchers. They will switch um, if they have a bad experience. <clears throat> When we talk about um, digital customer experience trends, there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, you know, artificial intelligence and chatbots are really being used more and more in, um, in the servicing industry and with servicing interactions. Um, customers today are used to information and um, immediate gratification, right? So it's the now economy. I want things now. Um, and so artificial intelligence and chatbots are being used more and more with um, messaging applications so that they can provide the information that's needed without necessarily having a human agent giving that information. Um, voice commerce, we talk, I talked a little bit about the voice assistants. Um, this is interesting because last, in 2017, the voice commerce industry was about 1.7 billion in the United States. It's projected to increase to 40 billion by 2022. And that's only five years. Um, so that's amazing growth there. And that's basically, Alexa, I need an energy-saving light bulb. You know, can you help me find one? Um, so that's, um, and, you know, and voice assistants are becoming more and more used in, um, in daily life. As I mentioned, you know, Alexa set the timer for 20 minutes because I'm cooking dinner and I need to, you know, time the oven. Um, predictive analytics, uh, we're seeing more and more of this being adopted as well. This is obviously very helpful in the marketing world, um, being able to use that data, run statistical al algorithms, and to be able to predict customer's action or provide information as it's needed. Um, so they can really target and pinpoint your, your customer base. Hyper-personalized experiences. I think, um, you know, maybe a few years ago, if you got an email or a newsletter from a company that you do business with, it might have been a little creepy because they might know a little bit too much about you, but I think as consumers, we're getting more and more used to that. Um, and so even before I checked into the hotel, I stayed at the, the Marriott. Um, I believe on Monday, I got an email from the hotel manager welcoming me and telling me what was going on in, in the city of Dallas. And thankfully, he told me it was going to be 100 degrees. So I went back to my luggage that was packed and made a change and put short sleeves on. <laughs> so, um, but that was, very, that was very helpful for me. Um, and then employee experience. This is something that um, I believe companies should focus more and more on because employees that have a positive experience while trying to function and do their jobs on a daily basis are going to directly impact a customer experience. And there's um, some statistics out there that say that uh, organizations that have um, highly engaged employees um, can reap the benefit of, you know, uh, by 147% or whatever. And then there's augmented reality, and I know you, you all know what that is, um, and there's a, that's being used more and more by uh, certain brands, you know, for example, L'Oreal, right? So how many women in the room, you all wear makeup? 
Um, several years ago, you could go to the makeup counter and they had samples. I think about that now and I'm like, mm, don't know that I want to touch any of that. How many fingers have been in that, right? <laughs> so, a little unsanitary, but now I can say, oh, I can check that eyeshadow or that lipstick or whatever um, and not have to actually open it up and, or purchase it, take it home and realize that it's really the wrong color. Um, same thing with Ikea and in the furniture stores and that sort of stuff. You can um, see how a piece of furniture is going to fit in your office or at your home without having to actually uh, make the purchase and that'll help you in your purchasing decision. But with all of this digital, um, you know, all of this uh, digital trends, there's that overarching regulation. I understand that we are in the United States um, and we don't have um, a, a GDPR like at the federal level. Um, but California came out with their own regulation and many other states are soon to follow. Hopefully it's going to be very similar. It's going to be very challenging for organizations to comply state by state. Um, but, you know, due to the large scale data breaches, um, you know, government bodies and consumers, everybody's on the watch and everybody's waiting to pounce should you have an issue or any type of a data breach. Um, but so consumers are looking for safety and security and even more so transparency from their brands. And transparency is really critical from a marketing perspective. So I'll use the example of Southwest. They had their transparency campaign. Um, and their value proposition was that we have no hidden fees and we have no um, you know, additional costs. The fair is the fair. Um, and so this campaign earned them 5 million Facebook likes and um, pushed them ahead of the competition in the world of low cost uh, airlines. Um, channel enablement, you know, we hear the terms multi-channel, we hear omni-channel, we hear them used interchangeably. I think um, we first started to hear the term omni-channel, um, you know, we were sort of doing a disservice to the industry by switching them. And, and it basically means the ability to communicate with your customers over a variety of channels, right? It's all about the right message at the right time using the right channel on the right device and, and whatever it is. And the difference really is where multi-channel may be single-threaded and the different um, channels are not well integrated together and omni-channel they are. And so omni-channel helps to foster that cross-channel experience where you start in one channel um, and then you might finish in, in another. And I will tell you that I had to, uh, at 6 a.m. this morning, I looked at this slide and uh, whoever created, I, you know, whoever created this actually had it backwards. So I had to do a quick fix. I'm like, oh gosh, good thing I caught that. <clears throat> And another trend in the industry that we're seeing with the enterprises that we work with is they understand that they have, um, they really need to start thinking about optimizing their, their um, CCM infrastructure, right? From a data perspective, they got, data is everywhere. There's structured data, there's unstructured data, um, it's housed in their admin systems, marketing has their own set of repositories for data, and it's everywhere. Um, so it's coming from multiple sources, and they understand that they need to eliminate the data silos so that they can create, you know, work to create better communications and obviously a better experience. On the composition side, um, last client that I worked with uh, had 30 different tools in-house. Um, some of them were homegrown. Um, some of them were the same tool, multiple versions across the organization. Um, how do you manage 30? composition tools, right? And how do you manage making a change, right? There's a change in a, a customer service phone number. Where does that service phone number live? And how many documents do I have to touch? And can I do a where is, right? Where is, where is that information? How do I make sure that I have it right? If it's compliance information and I need to update it and I miss something, right? Well, what can possibly happen there? Um, or they have tools that are, you know, no longer supported, um, right? The, the, it's gone past the, uh, the age of support because it's going to be retired thousands and thousands of templates out there. Um, content, uh, you know, version control is obviously an issue with duplicates out there being housed in different, um, in different systems or on a network drive or worse yet on an employee's hard drive, right? And somebody in the call center has something on their, on their laptop, on their, uh, on their desktop. Um, and then um, from a delivery perspective, um, you know, a lot of the companies that we work, they have limited multi-channel, they have print, they have email, they may have some SMS, um, and they're looking to, you know, to bring on additional channels, but they, they're, they're looking at uh, point solutions, right? And again, it goes back to that multi-channel versus omni-channel being integrated or not integrated. And then all of that just provides an inconsistent customer experience. So the struggle is real, right? For those that are you in the technology world, you're dealing with your clients and those in the service provider industry, you, they, you know they have a tons of admin systems out there. Um, one client that we worked in had 17 different admin systems for insurance, okay? 
um, some of those admin systems were being maintained for products that they were no longer selling, but they still had to keep that system. Um, data sources, like all of the stuff that I just recently talked about, but ultimately in the end, you know, it just creates a mass amount of technology debt. Preferences are an interesting thing, and from my experience working with some of the clients that um, I've engaged with, this seems to be a big gap for many, um, many of our clients, and that is that one line of business maintains, collects preferences for their, their customers, and they maintain their system for preferences, um, and it's, it's not across the board. So um, several years ago, I was working with a retirement company, and um, we were looking at their voice of the customer report. And a lot of the, the, the um, events that were logged in the report were, you asked me to sign up for electronic delivery, and I did, but you're still sending me paper. Well, you signed up for electronic delivery with this line of business, right? All the others don't know that. Or you signed up for electronic delivery, but it's this document, right? And you're receiving all of these other documents in the mail, which you did not sign up for e-delivery. Um, so preferences, and that's everything from language preference, right? Or do you need a, um, a document that has to be accessible, right, for, um, for, um, for uh, vision challenges? <clears throat> so how did we get here? How did we get from what used to be so simple to now it's so complex, right? Um, it didn't happen overnight, right? Um, so one of, the re one of the reasons is corporate acquisitions. Um, I was working at an insurance client uh, about three or four years ago and they were growing by acquisition and they still maintained all of the brands for all the insurance companies that they um, acquired. But the, our contact person there said, this is what we do. We acquire a company and phase one is to transition them over. And phase two is the promise that we're gonna convert everything over. And then phase two never happens. Anybody ever experienced that in a previous life, right? So I, um, so Skip mentioned that I spent 19 years in the banking industry. 11 of those years I worked for Fleet. Anybody remember Fleet Bank? It's kind of a New England bank, but um, it's now part of Bank of America. Before we became part of Bank of America, we were on the acquisition path too, right? So we were acquiring and merging with Bank Boston, Shawmut Bank, and, and whatever. Um, but their motto was, we have one loan system. We have one CIS customer information system. We have one CIS system, and we have one deposit system. It could be our system, or it could be from the bank we acquired, but we're gonna have one. And that was their motto, and that's what they, they did. Um, and I'm not trying to slam Bank of America, but when Bank of America came in, they had, they didn't even convert Nations Bank. They still had all of their systems. <laughs> so our tech guys were saying, oh, you're like, oh my God, what is going on here? Why are there 10 different deposit systems? You have the military bank, you have the California bank, you have this bank because they didn't convert them over. Phase two never happened, right? Um, when we toured their, their implant facility, there was a, a nice shiny print engine over in the corner. And I said, what's that engine for? Oh, well, that prints one job. That job was coded to print on that printer. And so, again, phase two never happened. So here they are, the maintenance on that printer, only running that printer, I don't know if it was once a day, once a week, or once a month, but it ran one job. Um, so it was very job specific. Technology patches, um, you know, low hanging fruit, let's just fix that with some code, uh, or we, we need a point solution, we need, need to email. Um, we'll we'll, we'll uh, go out and get a third party provider to e email a certain document. Um, I worked with a retirement company that will remain nameless, and their individual lines of businesses would go to technology and say, hey, we want to. Uh, we want to have electronic delivery for this document. And IT said, well, it's going to cost you this much money, and it's going to take this much time. And the line of business said, mm, too much time, you know, too much, I need it now. I need it now. We want this for our customers now. So they would go out and they would uh, source an email provider. 21 different email providers later, each delivering maybe one or two documents. Okay? So that's in addition to the 16 content management systems and the 15 print service providers that they were using. It was a little... <laughs> Um, their marketing director had said to us literally, if it was out there on the market, we bought it. We have one of everything. <laughs> so, um, so this kind of goes into the line of business silos. That's the example I wanted to really use for this, right? Um, lines of business operating in silos, going out and sourcing their own solutions, and then IT is stuck having to, to basically support it. Um, and then keeping up with the regulations. Now I know 
Um, this is going back a few years, and I know it wasn't regulatory, but who remembers Y2K and the madness of Y2K, <laughs> right? Everybody's like, oh my God, I'm still feeling that. It's like, right. But what did it do? I mean, I remember, I was still at Fleet at the time, and I remember it was like, this is the priority. We work on nothing else because Armageddon's coming January 1st, 2000, and the world is going to shut down, and nothing's going to work, and, you know, whatever. So I think Hurricane Dorian is a bigger threat, right? So, um, but anyway, keeping up with regulations, right? And so regulations that were, um, that came out maybe a decade ago, have they changed? Have you gone back and looked at those documents, right? Or have your clients gone back and looked at those documents to say, what has changed? You know, something that, and it could be, could depend on administration, right? Two administrations ago, something might have been put in place. One or two administrations later, maybe that regulation was lifted or modified or whatever. So it's tough keeping up with all of that, and it becomes a priority. Why? Right? A lot of, if, you, if you're not in compliance and you get caught, it's big, big dollars. Um, so another thing, how did we get here? Um, marketing sometimes is almost on their separate, own separate island, right? They, they tend to go out and, and do things. They've got beautiful documents, right? Like direct mail, absolutely gorgeous. Um, or, you know, great website design where you can, you can apply for a certain product and whatever. Um, but then what happens? Once you become onboarded, right? This is what you get, right? Right? So I applied for... Um, an insurance company, they're down here in Florida, again, uh, in Florida, they're down here, down in Florida, I keep, I'm in Texas, um, <clears throat> and the onboarding process was very easy, and then comes the 9 by 12 envelope, and I opened it up, and it wasn't even bound together, it wasn't stapled, it wasn't paper clipped, it was just sheets of paper, all of which had page one of one on the bottom, right? And Vard was just like, let me add him. Who is it? I want to know who it is. <laughs> Page one of one. And it, like, it was just all in the envelope. It was a mess. And this font, big font, small font, you know, stuff I need to magnify. It was it just monochrome. It, it's a disaster. And of course, I, I pay attention to this stuff. And, um, but anyway, we did some work last year with, a, with a, a big financial services company. And they were optimizing their whole CCM. Um, strategy <clears throat> and but one of the things that they had done was they were doing s sort of a um, like a customer journey light if you will and they were they picked one type of a transaction and they went from pre-sale all the way to acquisition and post-sale and they just lined a conference room with all of the documents that the customer would receive or could potentially receive throughout their entire journey and an IT guy walks in and goes yep right there. That's where we stopped caring about the customer because all the pre-sale stuff looked like that and then everything after that looks like this. So we said that's where we stopped caring about our customers. So. Um, and then how did we get here? I don't know if anybody in this room that, you know, whether you're with a technology company or a service provider or if you had previous experience with um, enterprise organizations, I don't know of any company that has one project going on. Unless, of course, it was Y2K, but that was many years ago, right? There's so many things going on. There's customer experience and digital transformation, and there's um, you know, projects that have to do with data security and compliance related, which always make the way to the top of the list. When I was at Fleet, um, it was always interesting to me, those projects that made it to the top of the list, if something affected an EVP. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So um, they get a letter in the mail, or a voice of the customer complaint gets on their desk, or they're in the elevator and somebody says, hey, my son, something happened and whatever, and magically that got a lot of attention and that got prioritized. These strategies tend to go off in different directions, digital transformation, customer communications, and customer experience, right? Everybody's working so diligently trying to make improvements, improve business processes, um, you know, figure out what we're doing with customer communications, um, improve our, our, um, our customer experience and make it better, offer new channels and whatever, but a lot of times they go off in different directions, which can be um, a problem in and of itself. So after all of that, the truth is it is broken, <laughs> right? This is what we tell clients, right? It is broken and it's, it's time to fix it. Um, if you sat in on the Explore webinar last week, I believe it was, Scott Drager, I love the title of his session, it was called It um, you, how was it? it um, you didn't, you didn't cause it, but it is your problem or whatever, right? <laughs> or something like that. It's not your fault. That's what it is. It's not your fault, but it is your problem. 
Um, and it's so true, right? Decisions that were made due to corporate acquisitions. That's not your fault, right? But now you're stuck supporting it and you have to, and you have to deal with it. Um, who remembers Nokia, right? Stephen Elop. Um, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. And this is a perfect example of why keeping up with, you know, why transforming and why changing your strategy um, is very important. Um, this was a statement that he made tearfully, as you can tell, on, uh, at the press conference when the announcement that Microsoft was going to buy Nokia. Um, and um, the message here is that, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't keep up, you know, you will eventually be removed from, from the competition. I read this article on LinkedIn and the author ended it by saying, the advantage that you had uh, yesterday will be replaced by the trend of tomorrow. So it's definitely time to, to rethink and refresh um, CCM strategy um, because it's customer facing and no matter what uh, channel your consumers are interacting with you, whether it's you know, email or web portal or phone or mobile app or whatever, this is the face, this is the window into your company. And that experience needs to be the same across the board. It needs to be seamless, it needs to be positive, um, it needs to be engaging so that they continue to want to do business with you. So here's uh, what I call a necessary evil, and this is a platform con consolidation. This is tough stuff, right? This is figuring out, you know, what systems are we going to retire and, um, and, and bringing it down to one, okay? Um, so a lot, lot of organizations don't make it past the specification gathering, you know, inventorying the thousands of document templates that you have out there. Um, locating, decoding, understanding business rules, business rules that probably are invalid at this point. Maybe um, they were written due to regulations that were created you know, a decade ago. Um, content rationalization, right? Multiple versions of content, multiple rep repositories, getting everything down to the right version and in a central location so that it can be used enterprise-wide. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to this, right? And it's, um, one of them is elimination of legacy software and all the associated costs, right? How much did it cost to maintain 30 systems at this one client, right? Um, my very first Explore conference, I met an individual from a um, large insurance company, and this, this is about like six years ago, and he said, we have 29 document composition tools, um, and we're buying our 30th one. <laughs> buying number 30. Um, Regulatory compliance, you know, if you have to change, as I mentioned earlier, a piece of content, what system is it on, what document is it associated to, what business rule pulls that content in, right? Being able to identify all of that. Um, reduction in IT resources, you know, it's obviously a lot less expensive to support one system versus 30 systems. <clears throat> and efficient change, compro change control which goes along with improving the workflows. I have document version one and document version two. What changed? How can I compare the two together, right? And, and streamlining that whole process to make it more efficient. And then being able to have omni-channel delivery as opposed to a single threaded channel delivery. And all of that, which obviously helps to uh, improve and provide a consistent customer experience. Elements of success. One of the big things um, that's gonna be able to push this type of initiative along is executive level support, vision, leadership, having a, a cheerleader and a champion for this effort. Um, that organization that I mentioned earlier where we worked with them on a CCM optimization strategy, one of their executives stood up and said, I own customer communications. And by that one person standing up and taking ownership, it was amazing the stuff that she could push through the organization and the decisions that can get made and, and, and how much quicker um, the program moved forward. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's the tendency to go out and purchase technology and then figure out what's our strategy going to be, and it really needs to be in the reverse. Um, the, the retirement company that I mentioned that had the 21 different email solutions, they also had, I mean, if you looked at gar the magic quadrant, they had all of them, right? Um, and when I was down there, they said, hey, can you come in and take a look? We're going to have a demonstration from yet another one of those organizations in that magic quadrant. Um, we're going to examine their, their software. And I said, but, <laughs> but you already have a Ferrari in the garage, and now you're going to go out and buy a Porsche and park it right next to it. You're not even driving the Ferrari the right way, <laughs> right? So um, you know, why, do you need another, why do you need another solution, right? Um, 
uh, challenge the, the status quo, you know, challenge the vice president of no or the vice president of status quo and make them understand that this is necessary. Um, focusing and understanding the customer journey, um, that's always critical, and then being able to transform business processes, and that's where digital transformation comes in. So some of the risks and challenges to overcome, doing a platform consolidation, it's a big deal. It's tough stuff. It's not easy to do. Um, and I don't know how many uh, CTOs or CIOs are willing to risk their career on it, right? Because they're, they're like, this is too risky a thing to do, and I'm five years from retirement, so let the next guy worry about it. Um, but that complacency is what got you where you are today, right? So you really need to, to, uh, to change your thought process. And I've had people say, oh, our whole infra infrastructure is being held together by Band-Aids and duct tape, right? So and we pray that nothing goes wrong. But, you know, going back to complacency, you know, we haven't had an issue yet. We haven't had a compliance issue yet, right? We haven't paid any fees yet. I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but the risk is there. Um, and then just the overall disruption to business, right? You're going to get a lot of resistance from the business lines um, because they're like, hey, I got my daily job to do. I don't have time for this, right? What we're doing works. I ran an RFP from an insurance company, and we were right at the point where they had put their business case together, and they were going to present it to all the presidents of the lines of business, and it's the president of retail life and uh, retirement and so forth, annuities and, and, and all the others. And the conversation I had with, I'll never forget it, and, the conversation I had with this individual was, let's just hope that all the presidents of each line of business buy in, because if one says no, the whole project is done. And I said, well, what do you mean? I could have a president of uh, the, you know, the annuity business say, our documents are fine. And I have this list of other priorities that I have to focus on, and I have to save X million of dollars from my budget for next year, so our, we're good. We don't, we don't, need, to, we don't need to participate in this and, and disrupt Right? Disrupt the apple cart. <laughs> um, so, and then there's the, it's too much work. It's too complex. We have thousands of documents. How am I going to identify and locate and inventory all of this stuff, right? I worked with a, um, a large financial services firm that had hired um, an external consulting company. I believe it was PwC, who had spent over a year with them, and they were specifically doing that. They were going through each and every document and identifying all of the compliance-related content within those documents to make sure that they were either up to date and ones that needed to be fixed were set aside and they had to be fixed. I can't imagine what that project cost that company. Okay. Um, and then there's budget constraints, right? The too much work, too complex, not enough resources ultimately ends at the end of a year. We've blown our budget and we have nothing to show for it. <laughs> so, um, we talk about ROI. You know, I, I sort of hinted at this all along, but you know, 30 document composition tools, right? If you elim eliminate that down to one and retire all of those solutions, that's a huge save right there. Same thing with the IT resources. Um, workflow, you know, going from a manual process of um, made a change to this document, it has to go to compliance, and then it has to go to legal, and then it has to go to marketing, and then it has to go to the line of business, and all along the way these changes have happened. How do you manage the back and forth, and do I have the right version, and what change? Oh, they put a comma here. How am I going to recognize that that comma was put in there, or one word was changed, right? So the whole workflow, especially in, um, with change control, right? You ask the IT department, I need you to change um, a phone number or a piece, you know, whatever. How long does that take? And they say, get in line. There's other higher priority <laughs> items in front of you. Um, compliance risk. I've talked about that enough already. But you know, if you have um, information that's not um, up to snuff with the regulation, you know, there's a risk of being out of compliance. Um, and then you have IT focusing on basically keeping the lights on and making sure everything is running. And then sometimes it's tough to change gears and, and get them to focus on innovation, right? So then you have this line of business who wants to make a certain statement deliverable electronically. And they say, OK, I'm not going to go out and, and go to a third party to get that, get that accomplished. So the strategies really need to converge together so that um, you know, the left hand really knows what the right hand is doing when it comes to um, customer communications, digital transformation, and ultimately the customer experience. Um, and so I'll end here with some final points. CCM is getting a lot more attention now. Um, I think there's this recognition that uh, to improve the customer experience, uh, you have to focus on how are you communicating with your customers, um, what's happening along that journey um, from, you know, pre-sale, to post-acquisition. Um, 
We're seeing um, you know, chief experience officers now sort of being elevated to the C-suite. Companies are out there looking for chief experience officers or people um, who have that type of experience and knowledge. They're setting up you know, customer experience teams to take a look at you know, what, what is going on um, in, the, in the B2C world. Um, one of the things that we recommend with our clients is you know, create a center of excellence for customer communications management, somebody that can set standards um, and make sure that the different lines of business abide by that. Um, the strategies for, you know, integrate the, st the three strategies together, like I mentioned, and then um, I, one thing that I believe is critical is just a platform consolidation for customer communications because it's very criti critical for your customer experience overall. So, and I finished on time. And that's just a mugshot, and that's my contact information. So, thanks everyone for your attention.